Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Rising Tide of Anti-Semitism During the Coronavirus Pandemic. Here is Scott Knapp, one of B'nai B'rith International's Senior Vice Presidents. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's conversation. As was stated, I'm Scott Knapp of B'nai B'rith International's Senior Vice President, and I also serve as Chair of B'nai B'rith Connect. B'nai B'rith Connect is our platform for professionals and leaders under the age of 40. This program is part of our guest series on policy issues related to B'nai B'rith's advocacy efforts. Today, our seminar concerns the rising tide of anti-Semitism during the coronavirus crisis. Our discussion will focus primarily on the sharp rise of anti-Semitic acts and speech, both in the United States and all around the globe, especially how it's affecting the younger generation. As the global voice of the Jewish community, B'nai B'rith is honored to welcome back Alan Carr, the U.S. Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism and our very own Chief Executive Officer, Daniel Mariashin. Alan serves as the United States Special Envoy appointed by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in February of 2019. As our Special Envoy, he advises the Secretary of State and is responsible for directing U.S. policy and projects aimed at countering anti-Semitism throughout the world. Prior to becoming the Special Envoy, Mr. Carr served in Iraq in the United States military as a prosecutor in Los Angeles County uh, District Attorney's Office. He also served as the international president of the Jewish fraternity Alpha Epsilon Pi, continuing his lifelong commitment to the Jewish community. Throughout his career, Carr has been a leader in the fight against anti-Semitism on US college campuses and throughout the world. Daniel S. Mariashin, as I stated, is the CEO of B'nai B'rith International. As the organization's top executive, Mary Ashen directs and supervises our programming, activities, and staff around the world. He serves as director of B'nai B'rith International's Center for Human Rights and Public Policy, coordinating its programs and policies on issues of concern to Jewish communities worldwide and the state of Israel. Mary Ashen also meets with world leaders seeking to advance human rights, protect the rights of Jewish communities worldwide, and promote better relations of the state of Israel. Thank you so much to both of you for joining me with us today and to all of our guests. Now it's time for some questions. If you could please be mindful of our time and try to make your answers concise, that way we can ensure a broad conversation and try to cover as many topics as possible. Towards the end, we also hope to have some time remaining for our audience to ask questions. If you do have a question and you're listening in, please send it via the Q&A button on your screen and we will do our best to get to them. Uh, as many of them as possible. Starting with our questions, uh, Jewish history, as we know, is marred by one blood libel after the next, especially in times of plagues and disease. Since the COVID-19 crisis became a global pandemic, we've witnessed an explosion of anti-Semitic conspiracies, blaming Jews for the virus, from the Arab world to Europe, to the far left and far right of the American political spectrum. Lon, uh, could you tell us, does this trend surprise you? And how do you suggest the global Jewish community respond? <laughs> well, does it surprise me? Not much surprises me anymore. But uh, first, let me say uh, what a pleasure it is to be with you, Scott, uh, and uh, with you, Dan. Uh, first of all, B'nai B'rith is one of the organizations, uh, really one of the deans of the Jewish world, and an organization that has made uh, so much impact over the last century plus. And and, uh, and so I, I uh, am a great admirer of B'nai B'rith. And then, of course, leaders like you are the reason that B'nai B'rith is as strong as it is today. Uh, really, um, not only wonderful people, but uh, you lead with values. And I'm so proud uh, to be your partner as we fight for a better, more decent world. And I'm also proud not only to call you my, both of you my good friends, but to call both of you my A.E. Pi brothers. And, uh, and that's a, a real honor and privilege. Um, so thank you for having me. You know, Scott, your, uh, your question is right on the money because you, you phrased what's going on in the context of, of uh, you know, of, of historical reality in anti-Semitism, which is that, that this um, relentless sickness that is Jew hatred has always throughout history uh, adopted current events and adapted to current events. And, and thereby always remained somehow relevant. Never rational, of course, but always, always relevant. You know, before there was a state of Israel, Jew hatred focused on the Jew in the community. 
Um, now that there is a state of hatred, now that there is a state of Israel, uh, much of it, not all of it, but m a lot of it focuses on the Jewish collective, the Jewish polity. Same thing here. Uh, before there was a coronavirus, it, it uh, you know, used various other uh, vehicles to express itself. And now that we have this global pandemic, does it surprise me that, that uh, anti-Semites are blaming Jews for, you know, for inventing, creating the virus? Uh, for, for propagating it, spreading it intentionally, for profiting from it, using it as a tool of global domination. Of course, it's all ridiculous. Um, you know, no, no, you know, equally ridiculous to, uh, to the blood libels of the medieval times or the fact that we, you know, that when it was said that Jews were poisoning uh, wells during, during the bubonic plague. But, but that's what anti-Semites do. Let me say something very important about this because you mentioned this as well. Um, there is a, a, a wave, a tsunami, of this today on, on uh, social media and on the internet all across the world. And it, it, it transects all regions of the earth. And a lot of it is our, our anti-Semitic networks and lone wolves, but it's very important to point out as you uh, hinted to in your question, Scott, that um, some of this is state sponsored or quasi state sponsored. And the largest, the, 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 the top, state sponsor of anti-Semitism in the world is the Islamic Republic of Iran. And they are actively, actively uh, propagating this kind of, this, this uh, a vile calumny that, that Jews have, uh, are somehow uh, responsible for this global pandemic. And, and for quasi-state actors, the Palestinian Authority is exhibit A. I mean, they're, they've been relentless on this score. And it's appalling and we have to call them out. We not only have to combat the, the lone wolves and the anti-Semitic networks. But when, it, when there's a state actor or quasi-state actor doing this, we've gotta be very forceful in calling it out. Let me just say one more thing. You know, this virus, please God, may it be soon, will be over and done with. It'll be in the past. But what will take longer is the economic recovery. And we have to be prepared for a kind of anti-Semitism that, that, is, is, uh, uh, that focuses on and that it, that derives energy from the profound and genuine suffering that this economic dislocation has caused. All throughout periods of history, when you have an economic downturn, especially one that, that has brought real misery, I mean, you know, your heart breaks for people. There are people who are, who are out of work who can't pay their bills. And whenever in history that's happened, the anti-Semites have come out of the woodwork to blame the Jew, and it often gets violent. And so my team is, is very focused on this next phase that you know when the when the virus is done that that uh, we've got to be ready to confront the the heightened anti-semitism that comes from the uh, economic dislocation that so many millions of people across the world are suffering absolutely and and thank you elon uh dan can you can you speak about the phenomenon blood libel and really what can we do to best educate our, our non-Jewish friends and allies to recognize it and how can they play their part to combat it? Yeah, well, you know, we have the expression, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And as uh, Elon pointed out, the origin of the blood libel, and what is the blood libel? It is blaming Jews for something, Jews as a collective, Jews as a community. And so it began in the Middle Ages uh, with uh, rumors, uh, that uh, Jews had uh, snatched or kidnapped Christian children, used their blood to make matzah. Uh, this uh, uh, also then poured over into blaming Jews for the bubonic plague, as, as Elon has pointed out. In Damascus, uh, in the Arab world, uh, in 1840, uh, there was a rumor that the Jews had killed a, a Christian monk, you, and the uh, same story. Jews were killed as a result of this uh, in retribution. A synagogue was destroyed. Now we bring it up to the present. And we have the coronavirus. Uh, we have the Iranians, as Ilan has said, uh, blaming Jews, but not only the Iranians. If you look on the internet all over the place, there are those uh, who are blaming Jews, uh, blaming Zionists, blaming the state of Israel, while the Israelis are working for a, a vaccine. And while the Israelis have provided assistance to the Palestinians and sharing their medical expertise uh, all over the world, uh, there is this, uh, this phenomenon of, of blaming Jews. And it goes back to the Middle Ages and before. 
So uh, we have this phenomenon in a in a modern uh, in, in modern uh, formation. What we can do about it, I think it's important uh, to educate young people. Uh, there are uh, numerous websites. There are opportunities for us to talk about the history of anti-Semitism. Um, we can uh, promote it within youth groups, uh, within public schools. It's extremely important. We haven't talked about Holocaust education. Um, we have some uh, uh, school systems and some states that have excellent programs in Holocaust education and some that don't. Uh, learning about the Holocaust uh, will, uh, by definition, inform one about the history of anti-Semitism. How did it get to that point in 1933? So there are a number of different things that we can do, especially, you know, the, the internet uh, is, is, a lot of it is for good and a lot of it is not so good. And we've talked about how the internet is being used now to blame Jews for the coronavirus. But there are a number of other places to go uh, for people to educate themselves uh, about, uh, about anti-Semitism. Uh, and um, it's something that we need to do continually. And I would just say this about the Holocaust because it's extremely important. You know, many, unfortunately, uh, many Holocaust survivors became fatalities uh, as a result of the coronavirus. And these are the people who, who would tell the stories. These are the people who would say, I was there. Here's the tattoo. I was there in that camp. I was there to witness this brutality, this anti-Semitism at its, at its absolute worst. And we've lost many of those, of those people in the process. And, and there will come a day when there won't be a Holocaust survivor to tell that story. So it's important uh, for us uh, to be right there. Uh, to pick up, to remember, and to educate. Can I just uh, jump in? You know, Dan. Absolutely. That, uh, that uh, you know, they're saying this about Jews and the coronavirus, despite Israel work, working feverishly on a uh, on a vaccine. In effect, the anti Semites have bought insurance with that because it, because they're they're saying it's because of the vaccine, right? So one of the one of the lines of attack here is that Jews created this virus to profit from it to develop a vaccine to profit. So just in case Israel might develop the vaccine or a Jewish owned company or a Jewish uh, medical researcher, well, uh, there's the aha moment. You see, we, we told you so. So that's the, that's the deep inherent uh, irrationality of anti-Semitism. No matter, no matter what the Jewish people do or don't, do, um, they're blamed for doing it or not doing it. And even if it's, it does good for the world, they're blamed for having done it. And, and that really is, is how you have to, have to educate uh, people on, on this and make sure they recognize, uh, they're not seduced by these, these canards, but that they recognize that this is really part of a historic and continually irrational pattern. And the, really the only thing new in this is the coronavirus itself. Everything else is the same old recycled garbage, the same old Jew hatred with the same tactics, using a new development in the world. Ilan, I, obviously B'nai B'rith, we are an international organization and have a tremendously strong presence uh, all throughout the world, especially in Europe. And looking at our list of participants today, I can see that we have a lot of our European brothers and sisters who are listening in with us. I'm curious for those in their 20s and to 40s, uh, the next generation of leaders, how do we look at the the activism in Europe and, and you know, France's situation regarding anti-Semitism is different than England's, but we hope to speak to our Jewish counterparts about how they view their climates and what advice we could give to them. What are your thoughts on that? So first of all, I would say that while every country has a different flavor and different triggers, anti-Semitism is a global phenomenon and its rise, its tragic rise in the last two, two or so decades, two plus, is really from the same causes globally. One is, is the uh, ethnic supremacist far right. The other is the radical Israel-hating anti-Zionist left. And the third source is militant Islam. And those three drivers of global anti-Semitism operate really across the world. And in fact, not only across the world because almost every country has representatives in different you know, in different proportions of all three, it's really global now because of the internet. So the internet really crosses all borders. And let's be honest, I mean, you know, the, the internet is the chief vector of this disease. It's not the cause of anti-Semitism, but there is no question that it is the way that this 
spreads and propagates with, with greater efficacy and seductive power than ever before. In fact, a, um, a recent European study shows that the time it takes to radicalize a young man, and I'm, I'm gender specific because it's almost always men, um, that the time it takes to radicalize a young man online is one fourth the time that it takes to radicalize someone offline, let's say in meetings and, and you know, rallies and, and all of the other ways that people used to do it. So it, this is really, it's, it's real. I mean, this is, this is powerful, it's transformative. Um, I'm proud to say that I'm the first special envoy in this role that has a principal deputy, my, one of my assistant special envoys, who is, a, who is assigned to focus exclusively on the, the problem of internet hate, internet anti-Semitism, really it's internet hatred more broadly, um, never before. And that's how seriously we're taking this. So we are absolutely focused on, on addressing this in a way, very important to say, that respects uh, American jurisprudence. We are not interested in censorship. Uh, we, you know, America doesn't believe that, that content-based uh, uh, censorship or certainly not, not punishment for speech is the, way, is the way to do it. But that doesn't mean there isn't an answer. And so, uh, and so it's very, very important to deal with this and we're, we're working very, very forcefully on that. Now, with regard to Europe, um, again, you know, every country has its different flavor, but this is a global problem. Um, I, I always tell my, 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 co my, well, my government colleagues in Europe, but I always tell Jewish communities in Europe when I meet with them, that it's very important to remember that, that uh, Jewish history in Europe is, is deep, is profound, and has been transformative. Next year, for example, 2021 will mark for Germany 1,700 years of Jewish history in Germany. The Germans are aware of this and are planning commemorative programs for this. So it's, it's, that's the, yeah, 1,700 years. And so it's very important that Jewish communities in Europe um, not feel abandoned. First of all, I'm here to say, let me say this as clearly as possible. The United States of America stands with you, will fight for you, uh, will 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 lobby your government to take every appropriate measure, not only to, to protect the Jewish community, but to make sure that the Jewish community flourishes. Um, and for every Jew in every country, um, they have a right to be there. Um, you know, some Jews are saying, well, we, we need to leave. And in fact, a large percentage of, you know, a substantial I should say, percentage of French Jews have made Aliyah to Israel. Um, look, Jews can make Aliyah, of course, and, uh, you know, but, but nobody, should, nobody should leave their home or their country out of fear. Nobody should flee. You want to move somewhere else? It should be for positive reasons. It should never be out of fear, out of flight. And so, so we're determined to make sure that, that every single country in Europe has a future. And, 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 and by the way, as determined as, as our government is and this administration is, let me be clear, the Europeans are determined as well. The number of, of, of European leaders who have said in these words, if there is no future for Europe, if there's no future for the Jews of Europe, that's their words, there's no future for Europe because they understand that anti-Semitism isn't only about the Jews and fighting anti-Semitism isn't only about protecting Jews. You know, President Trump always, every time he talks about anti-Semitism calls it, the vile poison of anti-Semitism, which is such an apt description because truly anti-Semitism is, is history's greatest barometer of human suffering. And every society that has imbibed the vile poison has, has been destroyed, has rotted to its core. You want evidence of, of how critical this fight is for humanity? Let's look at the movements in the last hundred years that have defined themselves through anti-Semitism and look at the damage they've caused. Nazism didn't just destroy the Jews of Europe, it destroyed Europe. Now let's look today. What are the, what are the movements in the world today that define themselves through anti-Semitism? It's not ancillary, it's central. The Islamic Republic of Iran, which is threatening not only the Jews of the world, it's threatening the world, the peace and stability and safety of the world. Hezbollah, a genocidal, dangerous terrorist organization that is responsible in part for half a million dead non-Jews in Syria, right? Al-Qaeda, um, ISIS, right? Look at the damage done by Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Movements, again, that are for whom, for which anti-Semitism is a key central defining component. So anti-Semitism 
And the fight against anti-Semitism is the fight for that better and, and more just world. So if we want to uplift the human condition, we have to understand that, that fighting this, this spiritual sickness that is indefatigable, that recurs generation after generation, is a, is a key way to make the human condition better. And that's, that's really what this is about. So I tell you know, the Jews of Europe uh, that, uh, that we are fighting for you and, uh, and stand up and be proud and shout from the rooftops uh, your role in making Europe what Europe is. Through uh, much of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement that we all uh, discuss as BDS, it's been marginalized uh, in the United States mm -hmm. across various sectors, but yet we know the movement still maintains a stronghold at many universities across the country. Most recently, I read an article uh, talking about the naming of Ilana Feldman, a fervent BDS supporter, as the interim dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. And this university, for many years, uh, has future diplomats and other foreign policy specialists that come out of that exact program. It's not too great of a leap to think that this sort of a circumstance and situation could have real world consequences shaping the minds of our next generation of issues, whether it be at George Washington or any other school, vis-a-vis uh, -vis American foreign policy on Israel. Dan, what, what does this say to you about the far reaches of the delegitimization campaign uh, in the United States? Well, first let's address uh, what's happening at George Washington University. I honestly, I, I don't know what, what they were thinking. <clears throat> I really don't. Uh, the professor who's been named to this position is a, a controversial figure. Uh, she <laughs> supports the BDS movement. What is the BDS movement? Is the delegitimization of Israel. And you know, <clears throat> when we talk about delegitimization, it's a word that almost conjures up a certain antiseptic uh, um, uh, you know, look to it. Um, what it really means is denying the Jewish people their right under the sun, denying the Jewish people the right to their own state. Uh, everybody else has that right. Jews don't have that right. That's what delegitimization is, is all about. And, and around that is, is uh, marginalizing Israel. It's speaking of Israel in, in demeaning tones. Uh, and why, of all of the professors, of all of the academics uh, at, this, uh, at this great institution, uh, why uh, this particular person would be named to this position, particularly at a university which has thousands of Jewish students, thousands of Jewish alumni and supporters, it's really beyond me. But what it, what it says, what it suggests is that there is now a mainstreaming of, of this phenomenon. That, uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, we had uh, some Palestinians and their supporters who were talking about uh, BDS and uh, people kind of dismissed it uh, as being kind of on the sidelines and not really uh, coming into the mainstream. What we have here, is an example uh, of a, a major university which says on the one hand, because the, the administration of the university said that it, uh, it is against BDS and yet made this, um, you know, this very important uh, appointment of this professor. So I'm, I'm very concerned uh, about, the, about the mainstream. And mm -hmm. then you have all of the other uh, elements that go into this, uh, entertainment figures like Roger Waters, who have large followings. Um, other artists who've said that they won't uh, play or perform uh, in Israel. I mean, this is, you know, in the, in the years after Israel was founded, uh, up to not that long ago, there was the Arab boycott of Israel, boycotting products, boycotting companies that sold products to Israel. Uh, but now it's gone, it's gone beyond that. And that is uh, really a, a deep concern of ours. And the way to battle it is to do <clears throat> You know, what we do every day to encourage states, I think it was Missouri just the other day, that just adopted anti-BDS legislation uh, to have major public figures uh, speak out uh, about this. Uh, and uh, you know, on college campuses in particular, uh, this is a worry because we have hundreds of thousands of, of Jewish college students, and many of them are being made to feel extremely uncomfortable when they go off uh, to school, and when they have to see this, we had an incident at the NYU recently, and many other many other schools. So uh, this is a, a deep concern, and should be a deep concern for us uh, in the Jewish community. And, and certainly, you know, from our work, we've seen uh, 
BDS movements on campuses. And I believe a lot of our followers uh, on here today and the next generation leaders would have seen the blockades and posters and demonstrations and everything else, uh, you know, votes through their student governments and the like. Uh, Ilana, what, what is the BDS movement though like outside of the US college campus that we should be alarmed about? So first of all, about BDS generally, <clears throat> it's not only about delegitimizing the state of Israel, it's, it's far worse than that. It's, it's basically saying, don't buy from the Jew. Don't have economic intercourse with, with, the, with the one, there's only one Jewish state, with the one Jew among the states, do not buy from them, do not have economic uh, uh, interaction with, with the Jewish state or part of the Jewish state. And I, I'll tell you, you know, just like with the coronavirus, where we said the only, the only thing new about this is the virus itself, not the tactic. Don't buy from the Jew is, is, is from, the, you know, from the Middle Ages. I mean, economic boycotts of, of Jewish, uh, Jewish businesses, Jewish people, Jewish communities is, is centuries old. It's centuries old. And, and it's a way to do something just short of actually extinguishing the community through physical violence. You extinguish them through economic suffocation. And that's what this is. And, uh, you know, we've all seen those, you know, those pictures of brown shirts standing in front of shops, uh, kauft nicht bei Juden, you know, don't buy from the Jew. That's what BDS is. Don't buy from the Jew, because there's only one Jew among, among the countries. And it's, it's insidious. It has to be called out for what it is. It is rank anti-Semitism, which is why I'm so proud that my boss, Secretary Pompeo, stood before 18,000 people at the APAC policy conference a year and a half ago. And he said, let me go on the record. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And not only that, he said more clearly than that since then that BDS is anti-Semitism. The global BDS campaign is, is at its core inherently anti-Semitic. And that's exactly right. And we've got to call it out. Now, that's not to say, again, we're not talking about censorship. We're talking about definitions. You know, one thing you hear all the time, whenever you, you try to define something as anti-Semitism, that somehow the defining conduct or words as anti-Semitism violates people's free speech rights. That's absolutely nonsense. Uh, we, can, we can define things as they are and, uh, and then talk about how to address it and how to condemn it. But we've got to be very clear in calling this out. And, and by the way, um, if somebody traffics in anti-Semitism, We've got to call that out regardless of the ethnicity or background of that person. And, and they might have a Jewish last name, but if they're, if they're tra trafficking in anti-Semitism, we've got to call them out and say what you're doing and what you're peddling is, is rank anti-Semitism. And you don't get protection by, by you know, what your last name is. And so that's very, very important. Now, let me talk to you about campuses because that was your question. You know, I've traveled all around the world. I've met with student leaders, not only in the United States, I've met with student leaders throughout Europe. And I will tell you that it is shocking the extent to which what I hear in the UK or in France or in Germany matches exactly what I hear in the United States. What I hear from students is that if you want to be safe as a student, as a Jewish student, if you want to go unmolested through your campus, check your Zionism at the door. Divorce yourself completely from any connection to the state of Israel, to the land of Israel, to that, that Jewish aspiration. For, for a Jewish polity in, in the ancient homeland of the Jewish people. And woe to you if you should use the Z word or if you should, or if you should uh, express your, your, your pride in, in, uh, in, in Jewish peoplehood or, or your pride in the, in, in the connection to the state of Israel or your affection for the state of Israel, you're finished. You're talk talking about harassment, discrimination, uh, marginalization, threats of violence. You're literally, it's, a, it's, it's sometimes a question of physical safety. And it's, it's outrageous that students are being told this at some of the most prestigious universities on earth. And so I, I am, cannot stress enough how important it is that just a few months ago in December, President Trump signed an executive order that said enough is enough. We will no longer stand with arms folded and watch this happen like, like uh, you know, we've done for so many years now. He said, he, he signed this executive order that adopts the standard and the standard definition of anti-Semitism that's that's accepted around the world. It adopts it for the across the inter State Department's been using it for years, but now it, he adopts it through that executive order for the interagency. And it says Jewish students, because of their their ethnicity, are protected by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And and any university that 
that promotes discrimination and harassment will lose its federal money. And I was there in the White House when he signed it. And when he signed that executive order, he looked right at the camera and he said, let me make this clear. He said, if you're a university and you are gonna promote discrimination or harassment of your Jewish students, you are gonna lose a lot of money. This is gonna be very expensive for you. And I promise you there's not a single university chancellor or president who did not hear those words. And this is a, a real moment of change. We have got to understand that the campuses are so often the, the front line of, of this fight. And, and very often Jew, you know, Jews are, are, are truly um, a, you know, discriminated against and harassed. And that is something that, uh, that no country should tolerate. We all have to stand up and, and call it out for what it is. And if it's not protected speech, if it's actually harassment, we've got to take action against it as President Trump has done. And uh, this will be my last question, and then we'll try to get to some of the questions from our from our audience. Uh, uh, what's the most important, or what concerns you the most as we look at our next generation of leaders, and what can we do to uh, motivate them to make sure that uh, we continue the right path of of combating anti-Semitism and, and leading by example? So, Dan. Oh, along, go ahead. Well, okay, so I, I, uh, uh, it's very interesting. In, in the in my first public appearance as special envoy a year and uh, four months ago, February nineteen, um, a, 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 a dear friend and a real scholar at the at the Holocaust Memorial Museum of Washington was. We were in a foreign country, but he was presenting. Rob Williams, yeah, Dan, you know him, I'm sure. And he he uh, he said that that really when you look at anti-Semitism in a broader and deeper way, it's a symptom of an erosion of values for our society. And, and if you're talking about how to really combat it, you have to talk about a values-based education. It's not just about anti-Semitism, it's a values-based education. I could not agree more. It's, it's interesting that that was among the first uh, panels in which I participated because I've been on, on this, mantra now for, for many, many months. Uh, we have got to go on the offense against anti-Semitism, not only play defense. Look, in my, in my role, our policy priorities globally um, are mostly defensive measures. So I deal with, with the security, the physical security of Jewish communities throughout the world, ensuring that they have the resources they need to protect themselves. Very important, but a defensive measure. Um, I deal with hate crimes prosecution. I was in Germany. We, and Germany's doing great work. We brought together uh, law enforcement leaders from seven separate German states to talk about how to, how to train uh, prosecutors in, in hate crimes investigation and prosecution. As a former prosecutor, I've prosecuted hate crimes. And so I know how important that is. Critically important, defensive measure. Uh, we talked on this, on this webinar, we talked about the internet and hate propagating through the internet and condemning it, defensive measure. Um, so all of these things are, are, are defensive. But it's you, you never win a war. You don't even win a football game if, if you only play defense. You've got to play defense, but you also have to play offense. What does it mean to go on the offense against anti-Semitism? It means inculcating, educating, driving a philo-Semitic narrative about the Jewish people because the opposite of anti-Semitism isn't tolerance. The opposite of anti-Semitism is philo-Semitism, an affection for, an appreciation of, a respect for the Jewish people, Jewish history, Jewish values, and what the Jewish people have brought to every country that there's been a Jewish community. You know, you can't tell the history of the United States or of England or of France or of Germany or of Russia or of Hungary or Poland without talking about Jewish history. So, you know, earlier I talked about 1700 years of Jewish history in Germany. It's 900 years or so roughly in Poland. And in, and in, in Russia, it's, it's it's many, many centuries, and in England it's centuries, to say nothing of the Middle East, to say nothing of, of Iraq and of, of Spain and of North Africa. So the Jewish community and Jewish values have shaped the world. And so if we really want to get serious, if we want to go on the offense against anti-Semitism, we've got to talk about values, about how Jewish values have, have shaped our societies and our cultures. You know, how many American kids know that, that in our founding documents, when the Declaration of Independence says, you know, we are endowed by our creator with inalienable rights, that that's a, a Jewish concept, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God, uh, every human being was created. And so it's critical we do this. 
Um, right now, we are right now in this month of May in Jewish American Heritage Month. Jewish American Heritage Month is a month that now 15 years has been declared by presidents of the United States in bipartisan fashion to be a month that celebrates, that champions the Jewish community and what the Jews have brought to the United States. So let me ask you a question. Do we do anything for Jewish American Heritage Month? We, the African American community does many things for African American Heritage Month. There are posters, there are materials. I've been around the country talking about this. And you know, most people have never heard of Jewish American Heritage Month. So if we're serious about fighting anti-Semitism, we've got to really start, start getting serious about using this important vehicle and other important vehicles to, to shout from the rooftops what the Jewish people are, what the Jewish people have been, what the Jewish people have brought to the United States and the world. And so you ask my concern for the next generation, Scott, my concern for the next generation is that we don't take advantage of critical opportunities to teach values, to teach those values, those Judeo-Christian values, and to teach about, about what, you know, how our country has been indelibly shaped in its creation, but also in, in its mission as we define its mission every, every year, every generation, every decade, by those Jewish values. That is absolutely critical. And uh, I look forward to working on that very issue. And Dan, what are, what are your thoughts on that? And how can we help mold our next generation of leaders? Yeah, I think uh, Ilan has struck uh, really a chord here in terms of uh, positive, first of all, for young people to have a positive self-image about themselves. <laughs> They're hearing so much criticism. A lot of it is directed at Israel, but it's, it glances, uh, it's kind of a glancing blow on Israel and it bounces over to Jews. And, and I think it's important to know who, who you are to know your history. If you make an excellent point, I can tell you back in the eighth grade, I remember there was a, a, a lesson that we were learning about famous immigrants to the United States. And so it talked about famous German immigrants and it said Albert Einstein. It talked about famous Hungarian immigrants and it said that Joseph Pulitzer. I knew that they were Jews, yes. but the folks in my class and I was in a class, I was the only Jew in my class. They didn't know that. So you know, Einstein got a pass as a German and then Pulitzer got a pass as a, uh, as a Hungarian. So we have to know who we are, the great contributions that we've made. By the way, not only here, not only here, you know, they say, uh, if you talk to Austrians today uh, and uh, you, you talk about uh, uh, culture, uh, the immense impact that, that Jews had on Austrian culture. And if you talk to, to people today who, who really face their own history, they say after the Jews were destroyed in Austria, that the cultural scene in Austria just went downhill. I mean, the great contribution, not to mention science, not to mention Jonas Salk. I can remember lining up to get my polio shot at the age of six and being so proud that what was going in, I wasn't <coughs> proud to get the needle, uh, but I was proud to know that this was uh, by a Jewish scientist. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you need a connection to the state of Israel. You need it. Uh, you know, Birthright has done a great job, and Massage, that all of the all the organizations are doing a great job. We've got to get more people to have that Israel experience. There's no question. Earlier today, uh, we had my colleague uh, and uh, some colleagues of his were giving a tour. It says Yom Yerushalayim today. It's Jerusalem Day, going around Jerusalem. You know, when you get to campus at the age of 18, if you haven't had, and Birthright comes later, but if you haven't had some kind of Israel experience with a youth group, or you haven't had Israel experience around your, your dinner table. So much is learned at the dinner table. If you don't have that, by the time you get to campus, of course we're gonna have a BDS problem because young Jews are not going to be able to answer that. So Israel, that Israel experience is important. And not only Israel geopolitically, but all of the things that Israel represents in terms of all that it is, is giving now. We talked about science, we talked about the vaccines and so forth, but it gives so much more startup nation. I mean, everybody talks about tech today. It, this, is, this is really where it happens. So I think that for, for young people, the best, if you will, vaccine, if we can use that uh, analogy today, the best vaccine is being very sure of yourself as a Jew, being sure of your own history, being proud of your history, and then being proud of the state of Israel and knowing what the state of Israel stands for. If you have that combination in your system, then you're good for life. And I think that's really where we where we need to focus. Bravo. I couldn't agree more, bro. By the way, Dan mentioned Austria, so let me just say something. Absolutely. I want to commend the Austrian parliament for passing 
a resolution that BDS is anti-Semitism. The Austrians did that. They followed the lead of Germany. Germany had done that many months ago. The Austrian parliament has, has done that. And, and now, right now, what's going on in Europe right now is that the Austrians are fighting, fighting like heck, together with the Hungarians, for the good name of the Jewish people in Europe. Right now, when the EU is talking about, about singling out Israel and mistreating Israel and sanctioning Israel, they're talking about sanctioning Israel. The Austrians and the Hungarians are leading the fight to say, we will not sit by and allow you to, to, allow you to do this. So I want to thank right now, I want to, I want to publicly thank Austria and Hungary for its, its uh, you know, sense of, of moral compass and its sense of justice in Europe. And I hope other European countries, because I know they mean well, I hope they, they pay attention and that they, uh, they, they uh, uh, come to appreciate, as Austria and Hungary does, that, that singling out the Jewish state for special treatment um, is not what, uh, what anybody should be doing, and it's certainly not what Europe should be doing, of all places. Thank you both. I think Alex is joining us. Uh, he has the questions that have been popping up throughout the screen. Yes, um, so the first question is for uh, Ambassador Carr. Um, early you, earlier you spoke uh, of how Israel, uh, Israeli innovation is unlike anything around the world, and, and yet uh, anti-Semites continue to, to boycott the state of Israel. Um, around the topic of innovation, what can individuals and, and organizations do to utilize uh, the same innovation that, that Israelis have to build bridges and, and educate the world? And, how can we use this innovation uh, and these amazing feats of entrepreneurship to bring people and, and nations together? Well, I, I think that's a, a great question. And I think you, you hit it by using the word entrepreneurship. I think you've got to be entrepreneurial. I mean, <clears throat> one of the best um, campus sessions I have ever been a part of, twice actually, this happened in two different campuses. And this was before my, my current role. I was at the time, uh, president-elect of, of AEPI International, and, and I was invited to campus to talk about, about Israel and what Israel means to the world. And here's what shocked me when I arrived. I was addressing a group of leaders that, that was across campus. I mean, the, the president of the student body was there, the president of the, of the Greek system, of the fraternity system and the sorority system, the editor-in-chief of the paper, the president of the veterans group, the president of the, the, the college Republicans, the president of the Democrats, the, I mean, it was the president of the Hispanics, the president of the African-American student group. It, they had this, these great group of student organizers brought together campus leaders from all across um, the different ethnicities and the different interest groups that they were leading. And they sat in a room interested in hearing what Israel should mean to them. Now, you know, sometimes people who are involved in the Jewish world or involved in the pro-Israel world almost take for granted, well, of course Israel is important. And of course, yeah, but you know what? We've, you've got to answer that question of what the Jewish people mean to the world and what the state of Israel is, the Jewish state means to the world. We can't take for granted that that's self-evident. You've got to answer that question. And, and the, the idea, you talk about entrepreneurship, of bringing together um, student leaders so that they can hear what Israel should mean to them from their vantage point and from their interest. Because after all, they were elected to lead their parochial interests. Why should they care about the Jewish people? Why should they care about Israel? Well, you've got you've to answer that question. And, and to have that opportunity was, it was magnificent. I mean, it was a, a great opportunity. And after an hour and their questions were, were as good as any, any question I would get from a Jewish audience. And I tell you, you, that's how you, that's how you really go for the, the jugular here and really build bridges and really make, make, make partners. And, and let me tell you something, a kid who gets elected president in college doesn't stop running for, for things, doesn't stop, lead, leadership doesn't end when you get your bachelor's degree. Anybody who gets elected president of an organization in college, you bet that they're on a leadership path, maybe in corporate America maybe in civil society, maybe even in government, right? And so that's how you do it at the student level. And by the way, that's how you do it after the student level. And it's no different outside of campus as well. You've got to create those partnership and build those bridges. And, uh, and that's how you can really be entrepreneurship and talk about all of the things that not just innovation of the state of Israel, but all of the, 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 the values and the, and the concepts that, that, 
Jews have brought to, to the world. You know, how many, how many people across the world know that the, the weekend, I mean, everyone treasures the weekend. It's a Jewish idea, right? Shabbat, Shabbat for rest. Is it, is it, we invented that. The Jewish people invented that. So uh, this is very, very important to, to talk about, about those ideas and really uh, make it resonant uh, for people who, who are well-meaning and who want to hear and want to learn. Well, great. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Carr. Um, Dan, this question is for you. Um, just this week, the uh, Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs shared a picture with the world of a commercial UAE flight delivering humanitarian aid to the Palestinians from Abu Dhabi landing in Israel. The <clears throat> recent detente between Israel and the Arab Gulf states has been historic. Do you believe this is a quote unquote new era and how might things play out if such cooperation continues? Well, that's a good question because the, uh, the last word on that story is that you're right. And Etihad Airlines uh, uh, airliner landed at Ben Gurion Airport with assistance uh, for uh, coronavirus victims uh, in the Palestinian territories. And, and today, the uh, Palestinian Authority has rejected that assistance. They've rejected it because the plane came directly from the United Arab Emirates and landed in Israel. Look, I think that tells you everything you need to know about the current state of the Israeli, uh, era, the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Uh, you have a transformation going on. And the, the world is moving under everybody's feet in the region. Iran is a hegemonistic uh, country uh, that uh, has uh, sent its uh, uh, forces into Syria. Uh, it has uh, supports Hezbollah, which is its uh, strike force in Lebanon, arming it with 100,000 rockets. Uh, just today, one of the leaders uh, of Hamas said that the, their greatest patron, their greatest friend uh, is, uh, is Iran. The Iranians are in Yemen. And even with the coronavirus, we just read today that 10,000 10, healthcare workers in Iran have died because the, the virus is, is, is really spread so much in Iran, and yet they still have time to support Hezbollah and, and Hamas and, and to speak out against Israel. The relations with the Gulf countries, of course, we'd like full diplomatic relations, and one day that will happen between the Gulf countries and the state of Israel. Uh, but there are some important things that are happening. It's true, a lot of this is around a common a threat, a common enemy, which is Iran, because Iran threatens them as well as it threatens Israel. So they're concerned about that. But I also think, at least with the, the people that I've met uh, from the Gulf, uh, and there are, there are a growing number of them uh, who feel that while the Palestinian issue is still important to them, uh, they have to move on. Uh, there's more to be gained by a relationship with Israel in all kinds of fields. We've talked about them here today in all kinds of fields. And this is a tremendous step forward. And if you add to that the peace treaty with uh, Egypt, which was signed in 1979, the peace treaty with Jordan, which was signed in, in the mid-1990s, if you add all of that together, the world is changing in the Middle East. Palestinians are the last ones to get that message. And uh, one of the criticisms, and uh, Elon uh, alluded to it earlier, one of the criticisms we have in Europe is that the Europeans who have largely sided with the Palestinians in terms of the narrative in this, in this conflict, they've done very little to get the Palestinians to the table to have a negotiation with Israel. Uh, for the last four years, the Palestinians have decided they're just going to wait out this administration. They're not interested. They're not interested in this a plan which is put forward, very detailed plan put forward by the administration called the deal of the century. So uh, yes, this is extremely important. The landing of this plane was important because it came with, with uh, supplies to help people who were victims of the, the virus. But more important is the symbolism of, of that plane landing at Ben Gurion Airport. This didn't happen in the middle of the night. There are photos of this out there. Everybody can see it. And this is extremely important. And it, it's, um, uh, you know, we, we don't want to talk too soon because anything can happen. Uh, but these are, uh, are encouraging developments, I think, uh, along the way, hopefully, uh, to bring you peace. Uh, between Israel and its neighbors. By the way, I was shortly before the pandemic hit um, uh, planning two trips to the Arab world, uh, one to the Gulf and one to Morocco. Uh, I very much hope to do that once, once we can travel again. 
Um, I, I don't think the Arab world has ever been more prepared to turn over an, a new page in, in this uh, narrative of, of Jew Jewish history, of the Jewish people, um, and really of, of acceptance for the state of Israel as well um, than, than it is now. I mean, we are really seeing a, a sea change in the Arab world, and, uh, and we've got to very much, much encourage that because Arabs are realizing that, that the, as I said before, the vile poison of anti-Semitism as President Trump always calls it, has it been a poison for their own societies? And, uh, and so I'm very excited about developments in the Arab world. And I, lo I look forward very much to going there and meeting with our friends and allies in the Arab world. Okay, well, uh, it looks like we have uh, time for one more question. Um, uh, Special Envoy Cars, one's for you. Um, what does education reform look like pertaining to unrooting anti-Semitism? Um, and how can nations adopt the way they teach their people to ensure this hatred doesn't continue to, for generations to come? So uh, there are two things. First of all, it, as a starting point, and at the very least, um, you've got to make sure that anti-Semitic content in schools is, is extirpated immediately and to its core. Because teaching children to hate other children is, well, it's, it's child abuse, um, first of all. It's, it's, it's such a, a terrible, such a wrong thing to do. But then also it, it, it creates damage that is, that is generational. I mean, it, it is so difficult to undo the damage done by teaching children uh, to, to hate other children, whether it's because those other children are Jews or whether it's because those other children are for a different color or ethnicity, whatever the, the, the ethnic, racial, religious hatred is, uh, to inculcating that in children is just a, a, a devastating result. Again, it's, it's evil to its core, but then it's, it's devastating in effect. And so first of all, we've got to make sure that, that countries who still do this rewrite those curricula. Um, we have friends and allies in the world that still have anti-Semitic hatred in their textbooks. And, and that's one of the things I'm gonna be doing when I go to those countries. It's gonna to be to say, look, um, you know, you, you can't be doing this. This is not, you know, this is, this is not how we move forward in the world. And so that's, first of all, has to be our a top priority uh, for all of us. Um, but then second of all, beyond simply uh, taking out, you know, anti-Semitism and racism from, from curricula, it's then gotta be proactive. You've gotta educate, uh, in a way that combats anti-Semitism. Now, when I say that, the, the first, the immediate reaction is you've got to educate on anti-Semitism. You've got to have Holocaust education. Yes, absolutely, 100%. Um, a recent poll in Europe showed that, that fewer and fewer kids know what the Holocaust is in Europe. In the United States, the statistics aren't better. I mean, there's a, it's still, a majority do, let me be clear, but it's a, it's a reduction um, in, the, in the number of people who said, I don't know what the Holocaust is or have never heard of it. Um, that, so there's a, a greater group of that, right? So, so that is a, is a warning sign to us all. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm, I, the Congress just passed the Never Again Education Act in the United States. Um, I think, Dan, I think B'nai B'rith had a role in this. I know Hadassah, Hadassah championed this, and I think BBI did as well. Um, but, but now we've got Congress on the record in overwhelming bipartisan and bicameral fashion saying that we will prioritize Holocaust education in the United States. Um, and so, yes, Holocaust education, which is another way of saying an education about anti-Semitism, is, is critically important. However, however, I hasten to add, as I said before, that if, that if we really want to get serious here, we've got to be positive about the Jewish people. It's not all, you know, Jewish history isn't only about anti-Semitism. Jewish history is a lot more than that. And so we've got to, to go, to go on the offense against anti-Semitism means developing, driving a philo-Semitic narrative, a philo-Semitic education in schools, but also a philo-Semitic narrative for our societies. That's in the United States, and that's everywhere in the world. That is the way you're going to change this thing. That's the way you're going to go on the offense, go really at the root cause of anti-Semitism, because anti-Semitism, I mean, what is it? Apart from its manifestations, what is anti-Semitism itself? It's, it's, a, it's an idea. It's a worldview. That's what it is. And ultimately, as we know, it's a spiritual sickness. 
how do you fight that apart from the manifestations? Well, to fight that, it's about driving values and inculcating that philo-Semitic narrative, that values-based narrative. And that is absolutely critically important. And uh, uh, my team and I are working on some very exciting initiatives in this regard uh, with some incredible partners. And, uh, and uh, God willing, we'll be able to do that here in the United States but then all over the world. And, and I, I, I'll say, I, I, think, I think all of us should be, should, should be paying attention and should be watching what Germany does because I'm very excited. I think the, the Germans are really getting this. And so 2021, when they commemorate 1700 years of Jewish history in Germany, I think they're very interested in, in turning the tables and starting to, to you know, drive that philo-Semitic narrative. Scott, I know we're, we're close to the end, but I just want to say one word. I, I think it's important to, 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 to mention this. Uh, you know, there are 15 million of us in the world, um, and uh, that's the way it is. Um, had there been no Holocaust, uh, there might be 40 million of us uh, today. Uh, but we're at 15 million. We need as many friends as we can get, and we have some very good friends out there. Uh, Elon has just talked about some of the things that have come out of Congress. Um, the uh, issue about the, the campuses and the administration, extremely important, uh, what, what is being done now to recognize anti-Semitism and to come to the aid of Jewish students on college campuses, <clears throat> extremely important. We need friends. We have, we have some good ones. You know, I always tell the story, uh, and I'll be brief, when I was in the third grade, I was, you know, again, the only Jewish kid in my class, and it was coming up to Hanukkah, it was Christmas time, of course, around that time, and my teacher said to me one day, come up, she, she said, come up to my desk, and she said, I'd like you to come in tomorrow and talk about your holiday, Hanukkah. Uh, well, I nearly died, because I didn't want to be any different than the others. Uh, but she recognized, even though there were 30 kids in that class, and there was one Jewish kid, it was important to talk about his holiday. Very important that there are friends, and, and the impact that that had, perhaps, on the others, learning that I was different, but for, for good reasons. That's extremely important. And we've got good friends out there. They're in some of the governments in, in, in Europe. They're in governments in, in Latin America. That they're, they're all over the place. And we have to cultivate them and we have to build new friendships in order to join the fight uh, uh, against anti-Semitism and in support of the state of Israel. Thank you both. I, Alon, if I could just ask one more question, because I see there's a lot of them popping up on the side. If you have a, a quick moment, obviously the the far left, the Arab front, you know, those sort of the BDS movement, they're easier to identify and probably come up with uh, a thought on how we educate. What are we? What can we do from a far right standpoint? Because that seems to be the other flip side uh, in terms of education. Well, it's the same. I mean, you know, when you're when you're te teaching about the evils of anti-Semitism, you know, we don't we don't pick and choose. I mean, this is the first thing I said, Dan, as you know, I said this in Jerusalem uh, at the Conference of Presidents a year and a half ago, my first my first real public appearance after my appointment. I said we will not ignore or minimize any part of the of, of the ideological spectrum when it comes to Jew hatred. So whether it's the 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 ethnic supremacist far right, you know those. The, the, that's the anti-Semitism of the, the neo-Nazis, those, those uh, uh, torch-lit marches that we see in parts of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the, uh, the, the vile chat rooms, hate-filled, venomous uh, chat rooms on the internet, <clears throat> or the anti-Semitism of the radical left that, uh, that, we, you know, that, that is, is alive and well on campuses, but also beyond campuses. I mean, look at, look at the, the, the terror the Jewish community faced in the UK, the terror. That they, they really felt that their future was threatened. Well, thank God <clears throat> that, that they feel a lot better now. But, but so the, the, the you know, hostility of, of the radical left to Jews and to, to Zionism, and then also militant Islam, which, by, which is responsible for the vast majority of the, of the violence in, in Western Europe is, is, from the, is from that you know, radicalized uh, Arab or radicalized Muslim communities. We will not minimize any of these. Because anti-Semitism is Jew hatred. And if you're serious about fighting it, you've got to fight all of it, every stripe and every brand of it. So when you are educating about the Holocaust and about the evils of anti-Semitism, certainly when you're educating about Jewish values and driving that philo-Semitic narrative that I think is so absolutely important, you're, you're really combating all, all three. 
So that's first of all. Second of all, when it comes to condemnation, too many people pick and choose. They, they're very willing to condemn uh, the anti-Semitism that comes from camps that are distant from their own, but they're, they're less willing to condemn the anti-Semitism that comes from camps, not that they, not that they support the, the anti-Semites in their camp, but, they're, but they're, they're quiet when it comes to condemning it. For political reasons, we see, see this from leaders who are afraid of losing their base. Um, we see this, by the way, for the left and the right. Right, we, we we see leaders in some parts of the world that are that are very reticent when it comes to condemning, uh, you know, radical right and neo-Nazi parties because they they're afraid it'll cost them politically. We see leaders on the left around the world and close to home that are afraid to to condemn anti-Semitism coming from from the far left uh, because they are afraid it'll hurt their base and 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 their electoral uh, uh, efficacy. But we can't do that. We've got to be We've got to call out Jew hatred for what it is. And we have to say it's wrong. And by the way, we should be, we should be quicker to condemn anti-Semitism from our own camp because, because ultimately it threatens our own credibility and everything we stand for. So we should look at, at home first and, uh, you know, and, and clean out our own houses, right? And so that's, it's very critical that when it comes to fighting Jew hatred, you've got to be fair in condemning it from every place it comes and not picking and choosing. And, and in terms of my work, let me tell you, we are fighting all of it because as I've said many times, if you leave two thirds or even one third of a tumor untreated, the patient doesn't do well. And so you, if you're serious about fighting Jew hatred, you fight all of it, well, why bother fighting any of it? And that's, that's been our, our marching orders and that's what we're doing. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. And then lastly, let me say, because I think you said that's your last question. Um, I wanna say this, it's very important to end on good news because for all the bad news about rising anti-Semitism, there is a lot of very, very good news. And sometimes we neglect to focus on it, but it's very important we remember uh, the world is moving forward and there is good news. Piece of good news, number one, is that we have amazing friends and allies, like Dan said, you, Dan touched on it. We've got amazing friends, not only in Congress, but we've got amazing friends in, in, as leaders at all levels, from, from government, leaders of government to ministers to, to anti-Semitism coordinators appointed to fight anti-Semitism in their countries. I work with them across the world. They're amazing and they're, they're changing the game. What they've done in their country is, is game changing. And so, and so there's a lot of good news. People really care about this. This isn't the 1930s when, when the Jewish community is alone. We have real friends. Second piece of good news is that, that although anti-Semitism might be rising, the United States of America is still the most philo-Semitic country in the history of the world. And, and our country is being led by the most philo-Semitic administration in the history of the United States. And so we are, the United States is, is, is second to none, and, and we have an unprecedented commitment uh, to fight anti-Semitism, protect the Jewish people, and support the state of Israel. And finally, that brings me to piece of good news number three, is that there is a state of Israel. The Jewish people do have self-determination. And the strength and the success of the state of Israel as a beacon of democracy and innovation and tikkun olam makes the Jewish people stronger everywhere in the world. And, and with, with that good news, I am confident that when we stand together, we fight together shoulder to shoulder with our non-Jewish allies with our leaders around the world, we will be able to roll back this rise in anti-Semitism and, and bequeath to our children and grandchildren that better future that they so richly deserve. Thank you. And, and thank you to both of our panelists. You have special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, Alon Carr and B'nai B'rith's own CEO, Dan Mariashin, for being with us today and discussing this important uh, topic. I also want to thank everyone who joined us, and I hope Hope that you'll come back for future discussions. Certainly, we'll have both uh, our special envoy and CEO back again, I'm sure, to discuss other things and hopefully update us on even more great news. To learn more about B'nai B'rith Connect uh, or B'nai B'rith International in general, you can visit our website at www.benaybrith.org. Until then, stay safe, continue well, and we'll make it through this, uh, this pandemic together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure to be here. And Josh, too. Thank you.